talking on overcoming therapeutic MHK and diabetes. For the last uh, two years, the world is grappling with a COVID pandemic, which is now showing some signs of ab abatement. But there is another pandemic, which is rising gradually, and there's diabetes. According to the latest IDF Atlas, published only a few days back, we have around 534 million diabetics worldwide, and the number is rising at alarming pace. In spite of all the technologies and the latest agents available at our command, so what's the reason of not achieving this diabetes control? And therapeutic inertia is one of the most important factors and diabetes management. So I'll be discussing in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I think this is not moving. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by a continuous decline in beta cell function with the resultant progressive loss of glycemic control over time. The hyperglycemic burden is associated with long-term microvascular and macrovascular complications. And early diagnosis and intensive glycemic control has shown beneficial effects. A very high proportion of patients fail to reach the recommended glycemic targets for a considerable period of time after the diagnosis of diabetes, thus leading to the complications. Guidelines for the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes suggest that tight glycemic control, as revealed by HbA1c below 7%, should be maintained for, from diagnosis through active titration of combinations of antihypoglycemic medicines and lifestyle modification. If we look, if we take a look, at the glycemic control in Indian diabetic population, scenario is very dismal. According to a diabetic care study done in 2011, the average HbA1c in India was 8.9. And one study done by ICMR in India Diabetes, which estimated the levels of glycemic control among subjects with self-reported diabetes in urban and rural areas showed that only one third of patients had good glycemic control with 31.3% in urban and 30.8% in rural population had HbA1c less than seven. Rest two thirds were in the category of fair or poor control. And with poor glycemic control, HbA1c and the risk complications arises exponentially. With the rise in the uncontrolled diabetes, burden of diabetes complications rises at a steep rise. According to a study, uh, there were about 11.5 million cases of TAD, 4.4 million cases of peripheral vascular disease, 11.1 .1 million cases of retinopathy, 16.8 million cases of nephropathy, and 17.3% cases in neuropathy. So a study done by 2011, we can imagine what would be the scenario now after about 10 years. Failure to initiate or advance appropriate uh, measures leads to accumulation of tools, avoidable glycemic burden of uncontrolled diabetes. And the main factor behind this is therapeutic inertia. The tendency to maintain current med treatment strategies despite results demanding escalation. The original thought about clinical inertia was highlighted by Philip et al. in the year 2001, who said that failure of healthcare providers to initiate or intensify therapy and indicated is therapeutic inertia. If we see the natural history of diabetes, we find inertia at every stage, whether it is general population with normal glucose, whether in pre-diabetes state, clinical diabetes, or with complications. 
and we can employ preventive measures at all stages to overcome therapeutic inertia. At population level, this inertia is in the form of not taking steps to improve physical activity or encouraging healthy eating and reducing obesity rates, leading to increased rates of type 2 diabetes in the population. In pre-diabetes, it is in the form of not doing community-based screening to identify pre-diabetes and altering a lifestyle in those with pre-diabetes, leading to losing the opportunity to prevent diabetes. In those with new onset diabetes, there is not identifying, identifying diabetes early, leading to delay in diagnosis, which increases the risk of developing complications. In those with established diabetes, inertia is in the form of not treating diabetes aggressively in early stages, leading to bad metabolic memory or legacy effects, increasing the chances of developing complications of diabetes. In those with a long duration of diabetes, it is in the form of not screening for complications on an annual basis, thereby missing the opportunity to identify complications of diabetes in the early stage and in those with early complications not aggressively treating the complications leading to end stage complications like renal failure amputation heart attack and stroke uh, over the years a lot of suggestions and discussions were there about cooling inertia and was thought that this term is too narrow because it uh, accounts only with the initiation and advancement of therapy, whereas there is also a potential for over-treatment, especially in elderly diabetes, where tight glycemic control leads to more harm than benefit. So a new term came, therapeutic inertia. Uh, clinical inertia should be reserved for lack of adherence to guidance recommendations when appropriate to do so, whereas therapeutic inertia was suggested as providers failure to increase therapy when treatment goals are not met, and importantly, to de-intensifying de therapy when appropriate to do so. For example, when a low HbA1c or BP target is inappropriate for a patient, which may lead to worse outcomes, like in elderly diabetics who are over-treated, like in uh, frail diabetes phenotypes, Patients of older age with very long duration diabetes, underweight, underlying heart disease or stroke, or with renal insufficiency. Uh, by paper by uh, Kunti and Davis, about 200 potential barriers were identified. Out of them, 50% were physician related, and 30% were patient related, and 20% were the structural system level factors. The ADA requires an A1C target of less than 7% for most people with diabetes. This goal can be set higher or lower based on each patient's need. However, fewer than two-thirds of people with type 2 diabetes get to their A1C goal, and only about half get to an A1C of less than 7%, despite a wealth of new medicines, treatment tools, and best practice guidelines. This number dropped over the past 10 years, while the number of patients with A1C more than 9% went up. Delays happen at all stages of diabetes treatment, from starting the first drug, to adding more, more medications, and then to intensifying insulin therapy. The ADA advises clinicians to advance therapy if a patient doesn't get to a goal within three to six months. However, the studies have shown that it often takes more than a year and even take up to seven years to intensify a patient's treatment. And likewise, elderly diabetes often remain in danger from over-treatment for so long. In a study of more than one leg patient, mean HbA1c at 8.1% at diagnosis, 22% remained under poor glycemic control over two years and 26% never received intensive treatment. 
a delay in intensive treatment by one year in conjunction with poor glycemic control significantly increases the risk of mi heart failure stroke and composite cardiovascular event a lot has happened in diabetes management after 1990 last two to three decades have seen arrival of many agents before 1990 Uh, we only insulin and sulfonylurea is available then came metformin alpha glucosidase inhibitors rapid acting insulin basal insulins glp1 dp4 sgl2 inhibitors but in spite of all these new diabetic medications and technologies the percentage with hb1c more than 9% is increasing from 12.6% to 15.5% the root at the root of problem is therapeutic inertia at the clinician related factors are we don't give sufficient time to patient we fail to set clear goals there is a failure to initiate treatment failure to titrate treatment failure to identify and manage comorbidities sometime patient hijacks the clinical encounter our approach is reactive rather than proactive at the patient level there's a denial of having the disease denial that disease is serious there's low health literacy sometimes cost of medication is very high sometimes there is too too many medic medications medication side effects poor communication and lack of trust between patient and physician there are system related factors also like there is no clinical guidelines sometimes no disease registry no visit planning no active outreach to patients no decision support no team approach poor communication between physician and staff so pillars of overcoming therapeutic inertia are research education and awareness and collaborative barrier busting what else is important to know about therapeutic inertia early tight control leads to longer term maintenance of glycemic control we all know a legacy effect therapeutic inertia leads to a reduced likelihood of, of achieving target levels later in the disease trajectory and early intensification of treatment in appropriate patient is associated with a shorter time to subsequently achieving glycemic control therapeutic inertia is been associated with a reduced quality of life for the patient along with increased risk of morbidity and mortality there is significant inertia in the diabetes management at every stage but when it comes to insulin things are even worse according to a landmark trial which is a first large scale a longitudinal prospective observational study to investigate management and complications we found that four out of five people with type 2 diabetes are uncontrolled in india and less than one in four indians with established type 2 diabetes receive insulin and at average a1c at which insulin is started is around 9.4 and even after starting insulin we fail to titrate or intensify the doses of insulin the average optimizing dose of basal insulin remains 18 units in asian countries whereas maximum dose up to which basal insulin should be titrated is 0.5 units per kg per day the various patient related factors when giving insulin there is misconception regarding insulin risk there is injection phobia fear of weight gain there is hypoglycemia concern there is negative impact on social life and job poor health literacy there are physician related factors also like concerns about the efficacy and flexibility of insulin therapy there is concerns of hypoglycemia there is lack of faith in patients competence for self management which all leads to limited access to diabetes care and medications in rural area also so what is the benefit of uh, giving intensive insulin insulin therapy 
at the initiation. We can preserve beta cell by, by giving early intensive insulin therapy because it decreases the decay of beta cell in the pancreas. According to a case study, a 41-year-old male had seven days duration of diabetes with BMI 25, with family history of diabetes, on sulfonylurea and metformin, with uncontrolled diabetes, fasting sugar 299, phosphate 374, H1C 1246. So I started insulin with sulfonylurea and metformin. After four weeks, insulin was stopped and oral antidiabetics were continued. And there was a reduction of HbA1c from 12.6 to 6.2 in four weeks. And there was an increase in C peptide from 1.6, the stimulated C peptide from 1.6 to 4.2. Another paper by Dr. Mokta and Dr. V. Mohan showed that early intensified insulin therapy in newly diagnosed type 2 patients led to sustained improvement in glycemic control and improved beta cell function. There was a change in fasting plasma glucose from 267 to 102 in 36 months and postprandial glucose from 408 to 153 in 36 months. HbA1c came down from 11.4 to 7.1. So to conclude, we can say when a patient comes to us, we take a decision without taking into account the patient's history or discussing with him his problems. We prescribe the medicine, patient fails to comply, and there is no improvement. But if we take a trust-based shared decision, there are more chances of adherence and taking treatment by the patient. To conclude, we can say that clinical inertia has to be prevented at every stage of the natural history of diabetes. It is possible to prevent diabetes in those with pre-diabetes. Once diagnosed with diabetes, good control of diabetes can prevent complications. Suboptimal control of hyperglycemia due to delayed intensification of therapy leads to diabetic complications and doubles the risk of cardiovascular events with type 2 diabetes. The strategies for overcoming therapeutic inertia must aim to improve the physician's knowledge and sharing and a structured education program for patients with improved communication and collaboration. So it's not about working harder, it's about working better. So take the time to develop a system to tackle inertia in your practice. Otherwise, if you don't deal with inertia, it will deal with you sometime. Thank you so much.